Good morning. We're getting a little bit of an early start on modern physics. I'm going to start with chapter 37. This is a somewhat qualitative lecture this Friday, so you'll be a little bit relaxed. We got about one and a half formulas <clears throat> that you need to know, but uh, it's important to start thinking in a different way. What made people start thinking in a different way when they realized that the laws of physics on the smallest scales are quite different from the laws of physics that we've been studying so far on larger scales? A large weight of experimental evidence started piling up around the turn of the century and in the early 20th century. It became impossible to keep on going with the usual classical Newtonian uh, mechanics to describe small particles like uh, electrons. But uh, the first indication that there was going to be a quantum revolution, I would say, was the photoelectric effect. I'd like you to know what that is, and it's really quite simple. How did people know that the energy of a photon corresponds exactly to a very small number, but a constant number of nature, Planck's constant, time times its frequency. E equals h times frequency. Well, that was first really uh, observed experimentally in photoelectric effect, and we've got it set up here. It's pretty simple. You just shine a bunch of photons on a thin sheet uh, or strip of some kind of metal. Now, as you know, metal has electrons in its uh, structure which are bound to the metal, but not terribly tightly. And so a little bit of energy could kick an electron out of this uh, thin sheet, and then it could be captured in some device like this uh, to be measured as a current. So even very small amount of electrons getting knocked out of this metal sheet could be measured by the, this experiment. That's how the photoelectric experiment was done. And here's the interesting point. It depends very critically, whether you're knocking out any electrons or not, it depends very critically on what the frequency of the photons that you're shining on this metal strip is. So if you have a way of varying the frequency of the photon, start at a low frequency, no electrons get knocked out of the sheet at all, even though, of course, photons, you can have a very intense source of light, lots of photons flooding this metal sheet, but if they are not a high enough frequency, nothing is knocked out of the metal. And the exact frequency where electrons start getting ejected depends on the metal. It's called the work function. Anyway, so this was a big breakthrough that people don't realize, and most don't, that the proper explanation of these results, which I'll show you in a second, was actually what got Albert Einstein his Nobel Prize. Even so it was a pretty important thing. I'm just trying to point out, even though, of course, his subsequent discoveries, such as special relativity and especially general relativity, were literally advances of 50 or 100 years uh, that took humanity forward and uh, really deserved a Nobel Prize, but this was uh, not bad either. Uh, he made so many discoveries that he really earned multiple Nobel Prizes. A, a giant, obviously. What can I say? Everybody knows that. Now, what actually happens when you shine photons of different frequencies on the metal, as I said, here's a graph that shows some typical kind of results. If your photon frequency is too low, no electrons escape at all. There's a certain quantum of energy which it takes to f liberate an electron from a metal. That's called the work function. And then as you increase the frequency of the photons that you're shining on the metal, the electrons will start escaping with more and more kinetic energy as they go. How did that happen? The ex uh, oh, by the way, with the work function would be several electron volts here. I want you to know what those units are, right? That's the energy, the kinetic energy that an electron acquires as it's accelerated through one volt of an electric field, a one volt potential on a single electron. So obviously we're talking about a very small amount of energy here. I think it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. We can look that up. Very small amount of energy compared to our daily life. 
but for an individual photon, an individual atom, this is a significant amount. And so if you go above four or five, depending on whether it's copper or aluminum or whatever, you'll be imparting photons which have enough energy, first of all, to free the electron from the matrix that they're in, the, the uh, structure of the conductor, the metal sheet, and then give it an extra kick of kinetic energy. So the extra photon energy shows up as kinetic energy if you go to a higher frequency. So once you cross the threshold, then the rest of the photon energy that got absorbed by an individual electron goes to the individual electron's kinetic energy. So this, Einstein realized that this is a proof that photons Although we know that light is a wave, and there are many experiments that prove that it actually absolutely has a wave-like character, in this experiment, in the photoelectric effect, we're not seeing that. We are seeing the particle nature of photons. It's a dual nature. It's a yin and a yang. It's uh, People get all mushy about this. It depends on how you set up the experiment, whether you will notice that a photon acts more like a wave. In many of the experiments you've seen before, interference effects, diffraction effects. But in other experiments with individual atoms, photons behave like little packets of energy. They are traveling at the speed of light, but they're little bundles of energy uh, with the energy equaling h, the Planck constant, times the frequency. And this is a perfect example of it, and Einstein explained that. Uh, so good for him and good for the people that ran these experiments. But here's the second breakthrough in the early 20th century. So I just told you that formula. There's the Planck formula for the energy of photons when we consider them as little packets or particles of energy. Very simple. E equals HF. We're definitely going to be using that formula for the rest of the course heavily. This is a key. Every time a photon is in there, and photon seems like they're always in the problem here, we're going to need to know that formula. And of course, you can see that if I told you the wavelength of the photon, the wavelength would have to get shorter to start the photoelectric effect ejecting the photons, right? Because E equals H times C over lambda. That might be another way that you might want to use the Planck formula if I give you in the problem not the frequency but the wavelength. You should be able to convert back and forth. But here's the shocker. This formula also applies to particles that we already thought were particles. Photons, you can argue. Is it a particle? Is it a wave? Everybody had been assuming and has always assumed that something like an electron or a proton obviously is a particle. And yet, and yet, and yet, the converse of this is true. You can't separate on a quantum mechanical scale the idea of waves and particles. They're just different facets of the same phenomenon. So, yep, you guessed it. Particles, such as, all particles, such as an electron, if you look carefully on small scales, act like waves. Wow. In particular, they are not perfectly located, localized at one particular point. But like a wave, you can try to confine the wave. But the more you try to confine it in space, the less you can find its direction, the less you can confine its speed. And this same effect applies not just to photons, but also, for example, to electrons. In other words, electrons are, are like a wave when you do the right experiment, and they're associated with a wavelength. And the wavelength is the de Broglie formula here, which is a pretty simple formula. Again, it's got that Planck constant in it. Not surprising. This Planck constant is the level or the scale of the world at which quantum effects become important. And it's really small. What is this? 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joules per hertz. That is so small. That's why you don't notice quantum mechanical effects uh, macroscopically in your daily life. Such a small number. It would be a fascinating world if we were much smaller or H was much bigger. But H tells you when the quantum mechanical world kicks in. And then it kicks in with a vengeance. What would be an ex Oh, what's P here? That is the momentum of the particle we're considering. It could be the momentum of uh, an electron. What's the momentum of an electron? MV. Oh my gosh, remember that from Physics 6a? MV is the momentum of an electron or proton or whatever, the mass of the electron times its velocity. This formula, by the way, folks, also applies for photons. Photons also have a wavelength which is 
of course we already know it's proportional to h, but it's inversely proportional to their momentum. Anyway, I don't think we're going to use that formula, but I just want to say this is a very general formula in nature. And so now we realize then that if we look at individual particles, I'm really concentrating on electrons here for this entire uh, upcoming week. I'm interested in electrons. On a very small scale, they will act just like waves. Wow, that is so weird. What kind of experimental evidence would we have of that? already gave you one piece of experimental evidence. Remember back when we were doing the double slit experiment? That was way back in optics, and we showed that photons can interfere uh, when they go through two slits because it's a wave, and depending on the phase relations, waves can constructively or destructively interfere, and so you get alternating patterns of light and dark on a screen when you project light through two closely spaced slits. I've shown you that in class. Guess what? And here's the fun part. In that little video that I hope you watched, it was very uh, well produced, Dr. Quantum shows that when you send electrons through a double slit, it has to be a pretty small double slit, depending on the wavelength of the electrons, electrons also interfere with each other because they are waves, they can have constructive and destructive interference. What does that mean? That means that if you run electrons through a double slit, there will be regions of very high probability to find an electron. That's like a bright region uh, in the double slit experiment with light. And there will be regions where there is virtually no chance, zero probability of finding an electron. Why? Because the electron wave functions destructively interfered with each other. I'm not going to go through any math or make you uh, work out a problem with that, but that was very powerful evidence that suggested that even particles that have mass, such as an electron, it's not much mass, but it's not zero like a photon, still nonetheless they can behave in these experiments like waves. Another example is diffraction effects. Now there is a nice diffraction uh, illustration, figure 3711. I have the textbook here. I, I'm going to see if I can get a, a better uh, picture of this, but 3711 shows a diffraction pattern. It looks just like the diffraction pattern that light waves make, except it's being made by electrons. So they do all of the things that waves do, if you observe them carefully. This formula, by the way, for most electrons uh, is a pretty short wavelength. So it's hard to measure in experiments that were being done, uh, you know, before the 20th century. Nowadays, of course, doing these experiments on quantum mechanical scales is fairly routine if you have, you know, a few hundred million dollars around to build the device. And then you learn lots of interesting things. Well, what's another consequence? And this is very important. Waves, like I just referred to a second ago, are not perfectly localizable in either their direction, their velocity, or their location. In fact, the more that you try to localize a wave in one direction, uh, it, it, the le sorry, yeah, in one location, the less accurately you know which way it's traveling. My classic example of this is how about if you say, well, I'm going to put up a barrier like uh, double slits. I'm going to try to make sure, and then I'm that I know for sure that the light wave, the wave, it could be a light wave or an electron wave, came in from this side. It definitely passed these double slits because everything else is a brick wall. It can't go through. It definitely passed these double slits. And now, because I want to localize it, I'm going to start bringing those slits closer together. And say, okay, I'm telling you exactly where the light wave or the electron wave was when it passed through these slits because I'm moving the slits closer together. You can do that. Are you defeating the uncertainty principle? I'm decreasing the uncertainty in where that wave was as it went through the screen. Well, good for you. But the more that you decrease the uncertainty in the location of the wave, what happens as the slits get closer together? Remember your formula, your sine theta formula? As the separation of the slits goes down, the angles that the diffraction pattern uh, projects onto increase. 